We are inside the Christopher Craft Mission Control Center at Johnson Space Center, a building steeped in history. It was here 50 years ago this week, a room full of brilliant minds put man on the moon. Half a century later, the world is still in awe of Apollo 11 and Space City. Tonight, we celebrate both. Griffin uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the limit. Columbia, this is Houston, reading you loud and clear over. Yeah, reading you loud and clear. How's it going? Lots of smiling faces in this room. The first lunar landing, July 20th, 1969, truly a pivotal moment, not just in space history, but the history of the world. And how it happened, what led up to it, is all part of the story, starting with a space race that Americans were desperate to win. Throughout the world, throngs of people hailed the end of the war in Europe. Now the war against Germany is won. When World War II ended, another major conflict began. The Cold War, a decades-long power struggle between the United States and Russia, two superpowers vying for superiority. But this clash of titans would not play out on a battlefield. This combat was cerebral, each country laser-focused on rocket technology. The Cold War and the rocket rivalry would become the backdrop for the space race. Russia claimed the first victories with Sputnik and the first human in orbit. Russia's success Potential enemy satellite. temporarily ahead. Then President John F. Kennedy threw down the gauntlet. First before a joint session of Congress. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And then with an electrifying speech at Rice University. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. A vision that took hold on a patch of land off 45 South, NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center. The Mercury and Gemini projects set the stage for Apollo, a program that saw successes and setbacks. Before any Apollo missions flew, the U.S. would experience its first space disaster. Three astronauts killed in a flash fire during a launch rehearsal test. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee forever remembered as the heroes of Apollo 1. I top everything. The missions that followed were building blocks for Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins would make history with the help of 400,000 NASA employees and contractors behind the scenes, sending America across the space race finish line first. That moment in the summer of 69 was celebrated across the country and envied across the globe. But there was one part of the world that experienced it like no other. Houston space community, Clear Lake, El Lago, Nassau Bay, Timber Cove, all were called home by astronauts, flight directors, and mission control employees, an area built on oil and then fueled by spaceflight. Before Houston was Space City, it was a bustling city with an identity of its own. In 1960, oil and shipping were the backbone industries for a population nearing a million. But soon, it would grow even more with an infusion of space pioneers. 
In 1961, NASA chose Houston to be the home of the Manned Spacecraft Center. Construction began on about a thousand acres on the edge of Clear Lake, land donated by Humble Oil to Rice University. As it was being built, the first astronauts moved to town in the summer of 62. The city held a huge welcome parade in their honor. John Glenn, just months after he became the first American to orbit the Earth, embraced the image of being a space cowboy in Texas. We were exhorted to look, act, and talk the part. We now look the part. We'll follow your lead in acting the part, and howdy. The Manned Spacecraft Center was completed in September 1963. Its opening ushered in what would become a stunning era of space exploration. The Gemini missions, the bridge to the moon, testing the skills it would take to get there, and then the main event, Apollo. And Houston was the center of it. Just months, weeks, and days before their launch, the Apollo 11 astronauts training at Ellington Field, at the Manned Spacecraft Center, and even in the Gulf off of Galveston. Rarely seen footage showing astronauts, engineers, scientists, technicians, Houstonians laying the groundwork for a moment that would change the world. But to truly understand Houston's role in that milestone on the moon, we must know, see, and feel what life was like leading up to it. The story of Space City and how it came to be is really, I think, one of the great stories of Texas history. How a, how a Southeast Texas cattle ranch became a virtual trailhead to space. Born out of a country's celestial crusade, a unique community that had never happened before or since. Entire neighborhoods filled with space workers. We thought everyone knew an astronaut. They were just regular people. Astronauts weren't celebrities in our neighborhood. Um, it was boy alive. That was just normal. We didn't know any different. Home after home after home that looked like any other in middle America, except these belonged to the greatest minds of their generation. We just happened to be over there on the other side of the street uh, working on a space program, that's all. We all went to the same bus stop. Um, we went to mm -hmm. school together. We were always out in the yard playing and, and it wasn't really um, different. They were just kids being kids while their fathers were changing the world. It was unusual for me to have two or three other kids in my class whose dads were astronauts or flight directors or engineers. Um, and we all knew when somebody's dad was flying. It was a rare utopia that was not lost on the wives. I want to know what it felt like. Everybody lived together and worked together. So what was that like? I thought it was wonderful. We all lived around each other, so we were always together. Behind my house, uh, Buzz and Joan Aldrin lived, and we had a gate that we opened. So we'd oftentimes, the guys were gone a lot, and so we, you know, we'd have coffee together or maybe afternoon tea. A quiet life for the wives as their husbands lived out loud, but the women did occasionally find themselves in the spotlight. Where are the, where are the microphones? Right here the <laughs> Barbara Cernan speaking to reporters in this footage found in our KPRC archives. Her astronaut husband, Gene Cernan, had just completed Apollo 10, and I can see the whole boat from top to bottom in my forward window. a dress rehearsal for the Apollo 11 moon landing. This is certainly one of the most exciting days of my life, and I'm sure that Gene and Tom and John feel the same way. Even a six-year-old <laughs> Tracy got some camera time. No. <laughs> I do look at the moon totally different. And as I'm older, I really look at it. It's very special to me and appreciate the fact that Daddy was there. And, and uh, he always explained how beautiful it is and, and how he always felt like he was sitting on God's front porch looking back at the earth. We're very grateful to those large effort of uh, people uh, here at MSC and across the nation made those first flights possible, successful, and made it possible for us to sit here today and discuss Apollo 11 with you. To launch the United States to the front of the space race and onto the moon's surface, NASA's best and brightest had to work and plan and train constantly. The pressure on the guys to do stuff was enormous. And my own experience, we were gone all the time. 
all the time. I'd leave on Sunday night, come back on Friday night. Which meant sometimes the wives had to be mothers and fathers. They served as den mothers and Cub Scouts and troop leaders for Girl Scouts. I've heard Barbara Cernan say, you think going to the moon was hard, you should have tried staying home. You learn to do everything. You learn to mow the grass, you learn to pay the bills. Um, keep the house together, do everything, and um, it, it just, I mean, it wasn't that it was so difficult, it was just, it became part of your life. I didn't resent it at all because I was doing my part. I, I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do to make everything work. Looking back at all that film and all the accolades that the guys got, I just thought to myself, I can't believe I was really a part of that. So now that you know how they lived, where were they as NASA reached that culminating achievement, putting man on the moon? I was in my living room with other people and it was, uh, I mean, you just, you were so proud as an American to know that we had actually accomplished what we'd set out to do. When they picked him up at the ship, that's when we had the champagne. <laughs> and I do oh. recall, y'all made us get out of the pool to come Gosh. watch landing on the moon, and then we're like, okay, okay, can we go back in? Yeah, exactly. You know, can we go back swimming? You know? Still ahead, a visit to an old Apollo neighborhood yields a surprising find. It says Neil and Jan Armstrong, 1968. Never before seen footage of the man who would become the first to walk on the moon. But first, the heroes of mission control. We're very proud of the work we did. And as a team, we hung tough. How a room full of space prodigies made history one harrowing step at a time.